Um, so I think the first thing we'll do is look at one or 251, that's 251, which is the um, act on the, the vestiture. We have draft 1.3 in front of us, um, dated 3-10-2022, 10-37pm. Is that what you have in front of you, Tom? Yes, that's the copy I have in front of me as well. Okay. All right, so I'm going to... Um, um, I think this is the latest one we got from Becky. It is. Um, yeah, yeah it, it, it is. And I just, there were changes I had asked for that are, there's one more that I had, um, uh, I had asked for section one to be titled uh, de decarbonization of, 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 of public pension funds, which mm -hmm. you didn't pick up on. So anyway, but everything else, I think given the new title, are what we ask for. Um, well, why don't you yeah. walk us? Why don't you walk us through it so we okay. know what the new title is? So let's begin here. at the beginning, uh, which is with the, the new title, which she would. I had we had asked, as you recall yesterday, mm -hmm. we asked for a new title being an act relating to the decarbonization and phased in divestment to the fullest extent possible of the state. Really that. I know. I'm just telling you what no. I said. And I'm going to spend from the fossil from fossil fuel companies. That's what we'd asked for. And she came back to us saying, I can't do that in the title. It's too long. So instead, she has a new title that is uh, an act relating to the study of decarbonization and phased in divestment of the state pension funds. And instead adds in the body, which I haven't fully found yet, but I'm sure everybody else has found it mm -hmm. um, on page one or two to the fullest extent possible is here somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just haven't found it, but Tom, maybe you found it. It's Where page is it? two, line one. Oh, well, there it is. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> I see. I just, I just read it, so I saw it. Yeah, okay. I, it, sorry, Tom, we've been on the floor and it's been a kind of crazy day. No worries, it's Friday, so I imagine you've had a long week. Well, I'm not, yeah, anyway, that's not the reason. But, so that is, and we, and then I think everything else we've asked for, uh, Tom, uh, I, I haven't been able to see what your response was because we've been so flat out here on the floor mm -hmm. and stuff. But, uh, so that is, that was her response to being able to retitle it. That was, we added to the fullest extent possible where we could. And we added the models used in New York and other states. And on page two, I would say most of the changes are in page two. And the other change I'd ask her to make is the titling of section one, which was to be the decarbonization of public pension funds, which she didn't do, but we can easily get that done. And Tom, I'd ask you how you felt, and I hadn't heard, but maybe you emailed. Well, I emailed. I emailed back. Um, I can forward it to the group. Um, okay. And I'll read. I'll, I'll just read what I wrote. I said, long term, the position would be ideal because it would give resources and flexibility to the team to continue and annually maintain all the anticipated okay. projects currently called for. So, I had put the language for the dollar amount, and that's listed on page two. That's the language that I sent. Um, Okay, so you sent this to her. Okay, yes. right. That's the language I sent to her that I think would be appropriate. Whether or not it's a person or whether it's 75,000, I guess it would be to, to be determined. But that was my, the preference would be the person because then we could use it year in, year out. And it could really help us with a lot of the different projects we have ongoing. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of money involved with studies. And if we could balance that out with more internal staff, that would be helpful to us. But that's that's just a preference. Yeah. So Yes. So um, if it's, a, I guess my point is when I emailed you back about a position is a little more challenging because mm -hmm. on the other hand, they didn't fill the position. I would then have a difficulty with just 75,000 because I think that you're going to need, uh, didn't we do a hundred last time for a position? 
We did, and I talked to Eric about that, and he said he'd make it work at seventy-five thousand for the first year, and then we come back in next year's fiscal budget request. So if if he said originally it was for seventy-five, but he could, we'd use the extra person to maybe lower the amounts needed for the compensation study request, and also the asset liability study request by using the new individual. And so he felt he would be comfortable with seventy-five thousand as a as a line item for an individual. I mean, I, that's fine with me. I, I, I think that the, the problem with this is going to be, if you're asking for a position, it's going to have to go, or it's going to have to go to appropriations anyway because of the money. But if you're asking for a position, they're going to have to also approve a position. Right. That's so my, yeah. what I would do is leave out, leave that off and just say, hire a consultant to in, assist. Because you can hire a consultant on a limited service um, as a limited yeah. service position or a consultant, and you could, in your next budget request next year, if you felt that you needed to, you could turn that into a full time position. But that would be for next year. I would not put in that higher analysis. That's, that's fine with me. Uh, you know, getting the funds in is fine, and we'll figure out how to use it um, to the best it, extent it, possible. That's what I tried to say message in my email back to you, which is a position of a slightly thornier now, it's Becky, a bigger hurdle for us to get over in a probe. I thought I had a response back that said that since we're an independent entity now, JFO made a didn't Becky Becky responded to that and said that the I, JFO, I, mean, oh, I haven't I had a chance to look at an email since then. So okay. I thought Becky had replied to that and that's why did I didn't she, let me okay. find it here. Um Oh, here it says, uh, I'll find it and I'll send it out to you, but I'm fine with either way. You know, it's, it's, it's the dollar amounts to help us do the work long term. Yeah. I'd rather have a person, but we can, we can talk that, about that in the future. And I, and it was part of the oh. negotiation with the governor's office. So. Yep. I would, I would cut, I would take that out so that it just says the VPIC to hire a consultant. Okay. Uh, or to hire consulting services or. Or just, I would just leave it just like this and to hire, hire that. Yeah, take that out. And then section one, it would be decarbonization of public sector yeah. funds. Were you okay with that, Tom? I'm fine with that. You know, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, clearly I, you know, I, there's a difference of opinion in regards to the titling. I do feel that that title tends to s state the, the end result, but we phrased it in a way that we can work with it and, and I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, Okay. Yeah, I, I won't go into it again. I don't want to quibble over a word. Can I just back up for a second? Going back to the position thing, I found Rebecca's email. She says, I checked with JFO and it says, since VPIC is now an independent entity, we do not have to create a state position. Mm. So she's saying that she's agreeing in the sense that just allocate money when we find it. We don't have to say for what? We don't have to create a position. So we just allocate. Seventy-five thousand dollars to assist. We don't have to say anything. Just the VPIC commission seventy-five thousand dollars to assist the joint yeah. oversight committee with the work described. We don't say hire anybody or yeah, hire because yeah. that implies they can do what they want with the money. As long as yeah. yeah, yeah. They want to yes. Yes. <laughs> the funds are appropriated to VPIC to assist the joint. Pen, public pension oversight committee with the work described right How, however they do that okay thank you Anthony. is the title okay now yeah. okay the title is okay and then yeah but do we want the decarbonization in the title seven? section one or leave the best one no uh, I, I do it on okay. line seven Right. Page one. Should do I write everything down? I've got it. Okay. Do we want to replace divestment with decarbonization? That's the question. That was your suggestion. That had been one of my suggestions to Becky, and she loved it, divestment. So it doesn't matter to me. I don't care one way or the other. We say both. BPIC would prefer decarbonization because then it matches our policy that we're putting together, but that's. That, then I. Let's let's think change fine. it to decarbonization then. Yeah. And then the new title talks about both 
<laughs> okay, great. So Tom, are you okay with where we're landing? I am, I am. I think there's a lot of positives in this and I think it can it can help extend the progress we've made in the 2017 report with the extra funds. And, and uh, I think it's listed certain things that I had concerned with, with in regards to um, a fiduciary responsibility and it's put, put that language in that I saw in Maine. So I'm comfortable with it. And I think we can come together with a good report and a good presentation to the state for next January. Okay, right. Okay. So that would be probably, I don't, I don't know how they do drafts here. Major drafts, no, com, drafts that come from the committee get a new first number and drafts that come from, uh, anyway, whatever the draft number would be. Are we agreed that we can? Yeah, it'll either be 1.4 or it will be 2.1. Yeah. Okay, I need to use it either way. So, um, I would be ready for a motion. Can yeah, just quickly just go over the change of order. Yeah, okay, I got distracted with Mr. Rebecca's Okay, you have the you know, text in front of you. Okay, so the change we're making is in the title, which couldn't be as full as we wanted, so that is now reflected on the top of page two. The first change on this paper copy of the page one is on line seven. Uh, the section one will be called the decarbonization of public pension funds, joint pension oversight committee report. Uh, the second change will be to an included investment to the fullest extent. No, that isn't a change. It is, it's an addition. No, I just meant the change we made today. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So the changes that that's a bit, that's uh yeah the changes and that's, made today that's on page one the decarbonization instead of investment and on page two on lines twelve and thirteen we are to get what's our pleasure to we could we have two choices no we're crossing off okay we're crossing off to, to fill, fill an down. investment analyst or position to or to hire a right. commit consultant. And, and just say it to, assist. to assist. Right. And they can choose to spend their money yeah. as they want. Got it. That's right. I, I have that. That's the second page. So we're going to make two changes. I think so. Okay. All right. Those are our two changes. Oh. So, so I think the re so I think Becky did try to honor. Our title change, it just comes at the end. Yes. Oh, oh the so title change no, always has to come at okay. the end. Okay. Sorry. Because it's introduced as no. something else. Oh, like, I thought yeah. I was confused. No, no. The, the, what she, what she mm -hmm. felt she couldn't honor was what Allison had sent her was way too long. Right, right. right. So oh, she did make it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. All right. <clears> so are we okay? I'm okay. Okay. I'm happy to move it. Okay. Uh, I would move that we amend uh, uh, S251 with draft, exactly. whatever the next draft is, whether it's 2.1 or 1.4. Yeah. Okay. 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 Senator Clarkson? Yes. Senator Colomar? No. Senator Polina? Yes. Myself, Senator Ron Hustel? Yes. Senator White? Yes. 410. No, no. Oh yeah, four ones. <laughs> and, and then I would going a little muddy. Okay. I I would further move that we pass out favorably S two fifty one as amended. Mm -hmm. Senator Clarkson. Yes. Senator Collimore. No. Senator Polina. Yes. Senator Romney. So yes. Senator White. Yes. Four one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Done with that one. We need to take a report. Not me. <laughs> Okay, thank you. You don't need me anymore? Oh, we do need you. I'm going to be in touch with you, depending on who's reporting it. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Thanks. Have a great weekend. 29. See you, Tom. But you're going to want to report 250, right? Sure. Yeah. I'm not going to chair it. I'm just, I'm just trying to think. I mean, I'm happy to do this. I am not a financial whiz, but I'm happy to take it on. <laughs> I don't know. Unless it's just asking for a study. Yes. Yeah. No, I know. Anthony, would you feel strongly? Would you like to, as, as our green economy person, would you like to do this? I don't feel strongly about it. Okay. Me. 
then I'm happy to do it. I just okay. Allison will do it. It's gonna go to a probes. Oh, there we are. Okay. Okay. Oh my gosh, this is quite different. This Thank camera. You. Oh, uh, I did it because we didn't have anybody in the witness seat, and I yeah, I, I did appreciate this view while I was eating. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, really, I didn't get off quite so. Much. I didn't notice this before, and it was right front. I know. Right just, there. <laughs> well, just like yours it truly is. I mean, I'm, well, but it's a different angle. Yeah. You know? Oh, like oh, okay. Ben, would you like to join us? Um, sure. Thank you for doing <laughs> So going back to the other camera angle because. Then you can see them. Yeah. So um, I do not have a completely new draft. I have language that is, um, it's like 95%. Um, yeah, draft. I was sure. Uh, it's been an insane 36 hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did have a couple questions. Um, and I guess once we're, I don't know if we're allowed or not. Um, but, uh, as just as far as the study that was discussed um, about non-coercive. Oh, yeah. Um, just some details about that um, that we can get to at some point. But, you know, Chair White, I just wanted to uh, you know, let you know that a new draft is forthcoming, depending on sort of, I guess, discussions today. Um, and I can work that into what's, what's being drafted. Yeah. Good, because I think that what, if I am right here, um, on section four, we asked for um, a report, an annual report on, I, get, I wrote you that note this morning and I don't know if I got it, asked for an annual report on what data, on data collection, what data is being collected, is it being collected in the same way um, universally, is it, um, how many how many agencies are collecting it? How is it being used, and how is it accessible? Mm -hmm. Is yes. that basically okay. what yes what we wanted in that report? Mm -hmm. So that's section four. That would be the report. Section four. So okay, and I had drafted that section. Um, okay. But again, this is not has not been submitted for public posting yet. Um, so if you just bear with me. I will pull that up. This is with the what's section two. Um, but the so this would still go within section twenty three sixty six of Title twenty. Um, so that's the law enforcement agency fair and impartial policing policy um, race data collection section. Um, and what it would do is it amends. under subsection E3. So it would now read that on or before July 1st, 2023 and annually thereafter, law enforcement agencies shall provide all data collected by the agency, including the data collected under the subsection, which is the roadside data collection. Um, and then it goes on to further um, amend subdivision four by striking out that the receiving agency shall also report the data annually to the General Assembly and creating a new subdivision five where there would be an annual report. So annually on or before July 1, all law enforcement agencies shall report the data collected pursuant to subdivision three, which would be all data collected by law enforcement agency inclusive of roadside data. Um, to the House Committee on Government Operations and the House and Senate Committees on Judiciary. The report shall detail how the data is collected, how the data is accessible, how the data is used by the law enforcement agency, a review of the data to determine if additional data criteria is needed, and any recommendations to improve data collection needs. I, I think that sounds good. Other people? I mean, it, it, it really is what what we're asking for is to act is it's a report so that we know where where we are and what needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. okay. Um, 
And in this new draft, obviously, the sections two and three have been removed, yeah. um, as we previously discussed. That's good. Uh, qualified, immunity. qualified immunity and the um, uh, training, minimum training right. training okay. section. Yeah. We voted on a qualified immunity bill today, such as it is. Oh, it's a pair of dams considerably, right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, I it's, realize it's that. essentially codifying Zulu and applying it to all law enforcement agencies in the state as because Zulu only dealt with uh, state police. And what we heard is that it would be applied by the courts, but there wasn't an assurance that it would be. So this applies it to all law enforcement agencies in the state and then asked for a report back from ledge council on on a, a whole bunch of stuff around qualified immunity like where where is it coming from what are the issues in vermont what are how is it being used a, a law a report from them with uh, in association with uh joint um, justice oversight committee Yes, and uh, if may, and I realize I never introduced myself to the record. Oh, I'm so, sorry. No, I, I don't jump right in. It's that type of day. Um, uh, ben Obergrowski of Legislative Council. And yeah, to elaborate on that, it, the, the report would essentially just create a, a, a broad overview of the status of qualified immunity in Vermont, how it's used in court cases, what obstacles it may prevent to the access to civil justice, um, and just more details along that. And um, the report would be published a joint oversight um, from legislative council, but with the assistance of the attorney general, the defender general, um, the uh, Vermont Law School, and, um, and any other stakeholders that are interested in assisting. Um, and then it would also create um, a, a basically a repository of, uh, of judgments and settlements from uh, entered into with each law enforcement agency. So those would be subject to public disclosure pending any applicable Public Records Act exemption um, and shall maintain the name of the law enforcement agency and the amount of money um, paid out pursuant to any any judgment or settlement. Um, so that that's to kind of help track exactly um, what's going on as far as payouts uh, to individuals and also um, the I guess the, the impact that it may have on the law enforcement agency itself as well. So, yeah. So that's what that's what it does. Okay. <laughs> um, so going back to S two fifty, um, there is a new addition as well. Um, and if you bear with me one moment as I scroll through. Um, uh, we discussed that um, in lieu of the uh, custodial, um, uh, the standard that would have been created under section nine, uh, there is now an amendment um, in what is new section seven to 13 BSA section 5585, which is the electronic recording of a custodial interrogation section. So what this would do, <laughs> Um, in addition to just updating a couple stylistic changes for more um, uh, gender neutral language, uh, the amends the bill so that in subsection B1, uh, a custodial interrogation that occurs in a place of detention concerning the investigation of a felony violation of this title shall be electronically recorded in its entirety. That expands it from just a felony violation of homicide or sexual assault. Mm -hmm. So it would apply to all felonies. And then it would create, um, and then it makes changes to ensure that that language is consistent throughout the statute and would also create a new uh, subdivision C2 uh, that um, creates the prohibition of custodial interrogation on children and um, requires custodial interrogation of um, people, I would, I would guess I would refer to them as, as youths that are not children. Um, so it would now read that a custodial interrogation of a person who is 14 years old or older that occurs in a place of detention concerning any crime 
shall be electronically recorded in its entirety pursuant to this section. The custodial interrogation in a place of detention of a person who is younger than 14 years old is prohibited. Um, I think it's good for the community to know that the, the, the age that was picked as the dividing line varies throughout our statutes over what is considered or who is considered a child, who is considered a juvenile, who is considered considered a youthful offender. Um, the ages range anywhere throughout our statute of 10, 12 years old, 14 years old. And there's also the considerations of the Raise the Age, Raise the Age initiative. Um, and this was sort of a middle ground that um, that was presented, the 14 years old. However, there would be a policy decision for the committee to change that age, that dividing line, um, if it so chooses. Um, but I think that's important for the, the committee to understand that these different age levels exist throughout our statutes. So I'm going to make one comment on that. And then this is just an aside. But when we were doing something before, I don't even remember what it was, but it was looking at ages of consent or whatever you want to call it. Age you can get married, age you can become an emancipated minor, age at which you can buy cigarettes. I mean, all of those things. One of the things I found, or somebody found for me, it wasn't, is that um, at what age do you think if a parent has a child that is completely out of control and they just, they simply can't deal with them, and they really think that child needs some kind of residential treatment. At what age, and this was a while ago, so it may have changed, but at what age do you think that the child has the ability to say no and object to the residential treatment? 16. Brian? What should it be? No, no, what was it? <laughs> Sure, it's always different. 16, yeah. Okay. I'm going to guess like single digits. I was going to guess single digits too. Yeah, like I was going to guess four. Six. Four. You have an out of control child and at four, at four years four. old, four, that's what it was at the time that we looked into it. I'm impressed you two got to single digits. Well, I would have thought 16 was consistent they, with they, other they, things. They might not have. Guess single digits if I hadn't been so appalled. <laughs> I mean, I, clearly, I, it was something that I was just stunned. I don't know how you could get any younger and send a child away, but <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anyway, that's a kind of a, an aside. But so remind me here. I it says that all custodial students. interrogations or interviews of juveniles have to be recorded. He says. I thought this was the section now on not using false information. It, well, yeah. it's, it's it's in the same mm -hmm. subdivision. Um, so the way it reads is that custodial interrogation of a person who is 14 years or older that occurs in a place of detention concerning any crime shall be electronically recorded in its entirety. So if you're 14 years or older, it needs to be recorded oh. like any felony would be right. um, for uh, an adult. Okay. Um, and then there's a prohibition on any recording if you're below 14 years old. Uh, what do you mean, you can't record it? I'm sorry? You can't record it if they're under 14? Correct, and I, that was my understanding of what the committee had, had I, I think that yesterday. I think that what we wanted was to say that no interrogations of juveniles could use those coercive tactics. Right, yeah. Okay, they're, all right, my yeah. apologies. Yeah, I think that that was, right. Um, and I would use the term juvenile. Yes, and I was thinking a higher age. Yeah, because if yeah. you if you use juvenile, then it's going to track with the raise the age yeah. and everything yeah. else. Okay. And and Tucker and Eric would both know the the um, cross reference to where that is. Yeah, and I have discussed it with them too. Okay. Um, and that's but, yeah, and I don't know that we talked about the recording of. Right. Um, June, I would be a little nervous about requiring that because um, of all. Well, I mean, okay. I mean, I didn't contemplate like the age of recording because I was just thinking if you can be detained and held, imprisoned, juvenile detention, etc. If that is evidence in the court of law, you know, if it's a juvenile, it's going to be private. It's not going to be shared as a recording in a public court of law and 
it's very illuminating to know how the you know for for it to be discoverable and for defense to be able to see how the interrogation went and what methods were used if you're if you're doing this read technique with a 14 year old yeah. even if their parents are present i think the defense would want to know how the interrogation that might have led to some kind of confession occurred and it wouldn't be a publicly shared video right because it's in juvenile i mean in family court i just think anything that could but it's not called a felony if it's a, yep. a, delinquent. a delinquent. It's a delinquent. Right. It's not, yeah. But felonies would be recorded. And felonies, a felony charge would be as an adult. I mean, you'd be charged. Right. And, it, and it could be actually, a juvenile could be charged with a felony and go to criminal court. Right. But that would, yeah. Okay. All right, well, let's. I, I kind of want to run this by Sears, but I don't know how to do that. Hmm. But anyway, I think that was the intent. It was yeah. not to, not to, I, I don't know that I would even talk about recordings at this point for the juvenile. Thing, right. I think that would raise a lot of questions. But I think we can say that the, it should, they shouldn't use the um, coercive techniques. Right. And I, 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 I don't know that that's the right word, mm -hmm. but um, they shouldn't, can't introduce false information information to so whatever we were using at the right okay banning um, the use of that so yeah it could be you know banning the use of coercive techniques which would include the read technique that we mm -hmm. discussed yeah. yesterday um or i could try and uh insert some of the language as um from the as introduced mm -hmm. version um that created new section 6609 um concerning involuntary confessions yeah um it may be worthwhile, though, to hear the input from uh, you know, other stakeholders. I don't yeah. know if they're available just on on what the correct terminology would be, just to make sure that it's, there aren't any. I think you see who's here. Is Evan, 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 Evan is here. Evan is here. Chris. Um, Julio. And Falca. Um, so what um let's let's look at that language then um yeah. but before you um i think the one other section on on that the one the two other things we wanted in there was one to ask the justice the criminal justice council to look at appropriate training and and um and particularly um at uh training around coercive techniques Right. Um, and then, and then um, uh, that was the asking them to do that, and then asking justice oversight. And I did talk to Sears about this this morning, and asking justice oversight to, to really look at that, the whole thing around the introduction of evidence and how that's used, and interviewing techniques, and that whole kind of ball of wax. Okay, so. It would be a, a working group, essentially. It's justice oversight. Okay, so justice oversight, and, and that was the part that I, that I'm still working on. Um, but you know, basically, a study on uh, techniques or, or non coercive methods, and I think including the read method that we had talked about mm -hmm. yesterday, yes. um, and then to include the criminal justice council, uh, CSG, and others within that group. I mean, I think basically. Were we talking about potentially contracting with them to? No, I don't think we're. To, I don't think we're going that far. I think we're just asking justice oversight to look at it, mm -hmm. and if they if they can talk council of state governments into getting involved in it, then they can find lots of times they can find some funding. But I wouldn't go as far as to say that. I would just say with interested stakeholders and okay. um, including that it, it could include the the uh, CSG, whatever that is. Well, we pay dues to CSG. Right? Well, yes, yeah, but so you have to pay them some stuff. Oh, well, we get a ton from them, believe me, oh, around justice reinvestment. They have done. They've done a huge amount of work and we have been one of their early champions. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think that, so those are the, the, those four things, I think, were what we wanted around the section nine there, the, the, pro, the recording of all felonies, the prohibition of using coercive techniques on interviewing children or juveniles, the um, 
see us, um, the Criminal Justice Council to look at the at training and what's appropriate and what what can be um, what can be used for recertification. Right. And um, particularly looking at training around coercive mm -hmm. methods. And Do they get stuff. to influence uh, local police on that front? Well, I think that what they do is they they can they have to have certain they have to have certain training every year or every so many hours, and they could say this is acceptable and this isn't acceptable. For local law enforcement as well. They have that every decision. well, every, it isn't. Oh. It's certified officers regardless okay. of okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah um yeah i mean this is the first time i'm contemplating the difference between what's a coercive technique and what's introducing false information that, co that coerces that confession or results in a, a confession um i mean there are two other states that have banned it so i just wonder if we mm -hmm. want to look at their language to see how they framed it Illinois. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me look right now. Okay. You okay. have time. So, so let's let's ask on on this section here that you everybody who's with us has heard the four things that we're asking to put into this section. That um, who would like to um, start us off here? Falco, would you like to start us off here and then? Um, I can think Chris Raquel, you can talk about the um, the uh, involvement of the Criminal Justice Council and, and then Evan, maybe. I'm happy to jump in and get things started. So for the record, my name is Falco Schilling. I'm the advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont. And without having seen the, the bill text itself as it's being worked on in real time right now, um, from what I've been able to gather from the committee discussion up to this point, I don't think we have any um, objections, um, but I think it, this, this all sounds in line with what was discussed by the committee before. Um, so I, I don't have much to add, but would be happy to review the bill text as it comes forward to see if there's any concerns that arise from that. Okay. All right. So um, Chris, do you want to thank you, Falco? Chris, do you want to weigh in on um, the particularly the training piece here? Absolutely, Madam Chair. And um, thank you again. This is Chris, Chris Burkell, the Deputy Director of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, again, as just stated, hearing this uh, language just verbally and not seeing it, um, I'll weigh in on what the conversation is that I heard. And certainly from the council's perspective, we would certainly want to be a, a part of any discussion that discusses training and what um, potential training might have any type of coercive type of nature to it. Um, that's not something that we would endorse and certainly nothing that we train in interviewing skills now. So we we would certainly be happy to be a part of that. One clarification I heard in your conversation that I think the committee should know is that um, when you talk about uh, Rule 13 and training, the in-service training for law enforcement, currently that's at a 30 hours per year for full-time in-service training um, hours. And the only mandated training is what is statutorily mandated that law enforcement has to take, such as domestic violence, fair and partial policing. But the other training hours that are submitted to the Criminal Justice Council for in-service training are decided upon by the agencies. So we do not specify, for instance, to agency A, B, or C, what that training is that they take throughout the year, other than the state mandated training. In fact, that's something that we're discussing in-house and we're in the process of an audit right now um, going on. So those are some of the things that we're looking at. But as far as the training, I just wanted the committee to be aware that we don't specify what that training is outside of the state mandated training. So maybe, maybe then we just let you continue with your the audit of what you're doing and then come back to us next year and say, this is our, we're recommending to um, law enforcement agencies around the state that this type of training would be acceptable and this is kind of questionable and and to have some kind of with the law with the law enforcement agencies develop some kind of a policy around around what kind of training 
would be acceptable. So maybe we just leave that out of this bill now and let you do your thing. That, that makes a lot of sense. So those discussions are ongoing as what okay. is acceptable training. Okay. I, I was sometimes I get confused with criminal justice council criminal justice oversight committee. I think you said yesterday that somewhere it was advertised their read technique. Training. I didn't say that. Somebody okay. else did. Christopher Julio may have said that. It just it did yes. strike me that there is you know a training happening now that's on a technique that I wonder if you if you were familiar with that te technique and think in your. Uh, opinion it would it would pass muster if we looked at this with more scrutiny in the future uh, I think that's certainly questionable um, listening to the conversation whether it was yesterday or the day before I, I know it was mentioned and I do believe it was Julio that mentioned it um, we as as the council do post things for other agencies when they are having training so that other agencies are aware of the trainings that are going on it's not a matter of support of a specific training. It's just advertising for them. Um, but having had been trained in the read technique in the past and also knowing the model that's trained here at the academy, they are two very distinct different models. And one does use um, types of coercion. And that may be something that we may want to look at as to whether it's acceptable training on the council's part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, great. I think I think that, that that makes sense for us to knowing the sentiment of the committee on where we're going to go go forth and do it and do good work. What what is that? Go forth and do good work? Prosper. Go forth and prosper. Oh and prosper. <laughs> but it's so we can say does so. that um, Ben, so does that help you with that? So we're we'll leave that part out about the criminal justice council. Okay. Okay. That with the training. Okay, so okay. no training for them, but that would, but we're still keeping the report for joint. Yeah. So now we have three things that we're looking at here. <laughs> and so if, if the those of you would comment on that, one is the recording of all felony interrogations or interviews, I guess is the word. Um, the second that, that is, is such a euphemism. I'm sorry, I just have to say. <laughs> the second is. Um, the prohibition about using coercive techniques with juveniles when interviewing juveniles. And the third is the Joint Oversight Committee doing a, a, some, a study over the summer on kind of uh, interviewing techniques in general, but particularly around the uh, introduction of false information, false evidence, I mean, yeah. So uh, Evan, it looks like you're, you've just joined us. Would you like to weigh in? Uh, yes, thank you very much. For the record, my name is Evan Meenan and I'm a deputy state's attorney. Um, uh, I listened to the committee's last hearing in which Commissioner Sherling flagged that some of the language pertaining to um, providing false facts during uh, could compromise undercover investigations. And the example that he gave specifically was uh, child pornography investigations. And I thought it might be useful if um, I explained a little bit of my experience as a prosecutor with the Vermont Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Um, I worked on those cases for probably close to five years. And I think that um, the, the, the concerns that Commissioner Sherling raised could still be present, even if this language was restricted to um, juveniles. And to understand why, I think it's important to keep two things in mind. One is that in Vermont, because of the raise the age law, a juvenile can be someone up to 22 years of age. That's when someone ages out of uh, family court jurisdiction. So a case involving luring a child to engage in sexual activity could involve a 21-year-old perpetrator and, for example, a 12- or 13-year-old child. The other thing to keep in mind is that this language in the bill is arguably not just restricted to actual confessions made by a suspect during a law enforcement interview. And to illustrate why that's true, I can go through um, 
a, a very quick hypothetical. Let's say an officer goes undercover online and pretends to be a 12 or 13 year old and engages in an email correspondence with a 20, 21 year old. And that 21 year old asks the officer to meet and engage in sex. The question under this bill would be, does the officer's representation that he's a 13 year old constitute a false fact about evidence? Then let's say in the hypothetical that the suspect arrives at the location and is arrested by law enforcement. Law enforcement interviews the suspect and asks, would it surprise you to learn that we have emails from you asking a 13 year old to engage in sex? Again, the question would be, does that question constitute a false fact about evidence? such that if the defendant says, yes, I did ask a 13 year old to engage in sex, that statement would be inadmissible. Alternatively, let's say the defendant denies having the conversation and when confronted with the conversation says, that's not my email address and lies about that. And law enforcement verifies that it is his email address because it used either a subpoena or a search warrant to get subscriber information confirming that it's his email address. That denial is a lie, but that lie is still incriminating. It's a statement, and so it's covered by this bill, but it's not a confession and it's not an admission. And so the question is, since this denial is a lie, is it inadmissible even though it's incriminating because a lie is not reliable under 6609B1. So the reason why these questions come up is because even though this bill refers to involuntary statements, it really does change the inquiry of what a voluntary statement is. Yes, uh, at your previous meeting, Ledge Council did a great job of explaining that currently under law, the question is whether under totality of the circumstances, a suspect statement was not a product of their own free will and rational consideration of coercive, uh, because of coercive government conduct. Under this bill, 6609B, really the inquiry becomes, is the statement that the defendant made reliable because it's true or untrue. The truth of any witness's statement is normally a question for the jury. And um, this change arguably would require the judge to make that decision during pretrial litigation. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had an opportunity to meet with all of the state's attorneys and get their approval for any you know, alternative proposal. Um, but I know that the committee's time is, is very tight and we're nearing the end here. And the intention is not to disrupt the purpose of this bill because nobody wants to rely on a coerced statement in court. But I think it would be easy to make an adjustment um, to 6609B by saying, and such facts when viewed in the totality of circumstances induced a confession by overcoming the defendant's will. And really it addresses the fact that we don't want people lying about evidence during interviews. Um, the central nature of the inquiry is whether or not the defendant's will was overcome, but hopefully it would not interfere to as great a degree in undercover investigations such as child pornography investigations. And I'm, ha I'm happy to answer any additional questions. So I'm, I'm going to make a suggestion here in the hopes of moving, moving forward here that it seems that it's more complicated even with juveniles than anticipated. And perhaps, perhaps we just charge judicial oversight this summer to really look at the whole issue of interviews, interviewing techniques, false information, how um, using some of the language from here and looking at the whole the whole thing instead of trying to reword here in a way that might or might not serve the purpose. And 
And I know that that is kicking the can down the road, but I think that if we can ask them to do some kind of in-depth uh, research and hopefully um, Council of State Governments, the Justice Center can can really be helpful with them around that about what what are best practices in in interviewing and what are um, uh, how should how should we do this and how should we avoid getting confessions by the use of false statements and when is it appropriate? And when is it not appropriate? Because it might be appropriate when you're, if you're dealing with child pornography, that there might be some instances where it really is appropriate to, to use some of those. And we don't want to, it is, I'm trying to get us to a point where right. we can, we can yes. really um, um, move, move something forward here and, and ask them to, to look at it and they meet regularly and they are, um, I will say a very effective and um, hardworking. Yeah, I mean, I personally didn't hear that as particularly compelling to not be able to find a way to work on the language to deal with those circumstances. So I was gonna ask Evan if he's familiar with Illinois law that they passed around this that probably took into account the concerns that he raised and hear from Julio because the whole second piece, personally, I didn't, I don't, I don't think that's real. I, I didn't, I wasn't hearing where that was relevant to the bill at all. Um, the idea that if someone, if you confront them with a fact and they deny that fact, that that's somehow introducing false information. I, I didn't understand the, the point there. Sure. So, and I guess to answer the first part of your question, I'm not familiar with Illinois' law. And I think the, 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 the issue that I'm trying to raise is that it's, it's not clear to me, at least, that this bill is restricted to um, interviews as, uh, of suspects when they, make, when they confess to a crime. And that is because on page 19, line four, it refers to confessions, admissions, or other statements. So it's really any statement by a defendant, whether or not the statement is true or untrue. So it could be a statement where they admit to doing something wrong, or it could be a statement where they deny doing something wrong, but that denial is also incriminating. For example, someone is captured on surveillance uh, footage robbing a bank, and they say, I wasn't at the bank. I was in another state at the time. That lie is indicative of their culpable mental state. And so the bit about some, and the reason why that's important is because on lines 14 and 15, it talks about undermining the reliability of the defendant's statement. Well, a lie is inherently unreliable because it's not truthful. So we're changing the inquiry from, did this person voluntarily make a statement or was their statement not true? That's, that's the concern. Um, you know, I do think that it would be, you know, uh, I, I do think, I don't, I don't anticipate that the state's attorneys would oppose a bill that would say, if you lie, if you're providing false evidence, false information to a defendant during an interview, you're lying about the state of the evidence and that lie uh, coerces someone to make a false confession that should not be admissible. And that's because that's, that's established law. Um, the question is how to get there. And, and, and I apologize, um, Senator White, I, I don't think I answered the first part of your questions, which is about recording law enforcement interviews, the change to 5585. Yeah. I would not anticipate the state's attorneys would object to that. And, and they certainly would not object to joint legislative oversight or the Criminal Justice Council considering this issue further. It, it's worthy of additional consideration for sure. You know, the only reason I'm suggesting that is because um, I'm, as I said, when we started here, people think we're a little frantic or disjointed. It's because we now have 15 minutes left for this bill. And I, um, I, I want us to get to a point where I think we're, in agreement that we should say all felony um, interviews should be recorded. 
Yes, we're like that. Okay, so I think we can say that. And then I I would put the rest into a study by the Joint Oversight Committee just to get us oh, because I don't time. what they'll have more time. I mean, I think we need well, well, I think we need to get it right. And and I I fear that in the next fifteen minutes we're not going to have the ability to get it really right. And I it makes me very nervous to pass something that. Um, and I did talk to Sears about it, and he said that they would be very happy to look at that whole thing about false information and false confessions and lying, um, presenting false information. So he was he was very open to that, and and I just think that by working with um, with the Council of State Government, that they're um, really um, helpful in coming up with good language and they will know the Illinois bill and they will know I think you said there was one other state that also did that so that that's my suggestion at this point with with the section nine on the bill is I realize Julio has his hand up I just want to make sure Julio that you know that we have 15 minutes to, to finish this bill that's that's it so um, did you have a comment you wanted to make just a couple, just very brief comment that it might help, you know, it might help spur a, a decision in the next 15 minutes. So amending the bill to include or limit it to cases where it overcomes the person's voluntariness um, is unnecessary. That's been constitutional law since 1969. Uh, that hasn't been permitted for in Vermont for over 50 years. And so it, it, it doesn't change the standard at all. So I don't, I don't see the point of, of adding it in statute. Um, the other state that has uh, the, the law that was enacted was in Oregon. Both Illinois and Oregon limit the, this issue to custodial interviews. That is somebody who's not free to leave. So someone who's arrested or detained and not free to leave. It, it does not cover undercover operations. Similarly, they, those two laws only cover confessions. And they, they both say that they are presumptively involuntary, but that the state can prove, that if the state can come up with evidence to show that it really was voluntary, then the state is permitted to do that as have them having the burden of showing voluntariness rather than having the presumption of voluntariness and putting it on the defendant to, to put it in doubt. In Illinois, you have to prove it by a preponderance of the evidence that it was voluntary. In Oregon, you have to prove it by clear and convincing evidence. So those are the existing laws. Our recommendation was, uh, from our office, we think that the committee could accomplish a, a more ambitious goal, which is to have the CJ to have a bill that says that departments will have to comply with a model policy developed by the CJC and whoever else you want involved in that, the same way that you required them to comply with an FIP policy and you can create the timelines. But <clears throat> policies and, and interrogations of interviews, um, this has been an issue that I pointed out that's been flagged by the, one of the leading law enforcement uh, organizations, uh, the IACP since 2012. So there's a stack of policies out there where people can get to work on this issue in plenty of time. So rather than having a study and then pe people starting in January about, okay, what language to put together, our office is, you know, would, would like to see uh, just a, a mandate that they develop a policy by a certain date and that agencies have to comply with that policy. Julio, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but we now have 10 minutes, and it isn't 10 minutes more of debate. It's 10 minutes to get this bill passed. We we can't start rewording this in any way, I don't think. And we can't, I, I don't want to put in here that they have to come up with a policy until we have, until the Justice Oversight Committee looks at does a lot of research on it and tries to figure out what the policy might be because personally, I'm not sure that sometimes I don't agree with um, mandated, following mandated policies because they don't take into account any, and anyway, I'm not gonna go into my rant on 
on, on mandated that. policies. But um, I think that what we have to do is we have to, I, I firmly believe that we need to ask justice oversight to work with the Council of State Governments or whoever, to, that they should come up with some kind of um, a study here on how best to do this. Or, while looking at, yeah. or New York and, I mean, um, Oregon and mm -hmm. Illinois, yeah. Illinois. Thank uh -huh. you, Oregon and Illinois and other policies that are out there and that that's what we need to do. We do not have time to, to start amending this bill. I mean, we just, I mean, so we don't. So what you just said is still amending the bill, right? It's still a change. Yeah. So well, it's a, it's a strike all. <laughs> it's a strike right. all bill. And, sure. we're, and we're, but we're not going to start rewording this section, I don't think. I don't think we have time to do that. Okay. 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 I'm just asking, I, I think the compromise is more along the line of what Julio is saying, even if it doesn't go into effect without coming back to us. I just think it's, asking for a study isn't the same as asking for recommendation. a recommendation about model language. Yes. Uh, we, I can, we can ask for a recommendation. That. I, I, would, I, that's okay. Okay. I, I don't want to no. no. so I'd like a recommendation. Similar to the debate But a recommendation yeah. for model policy? You don't want to see it. Yeah, they're going to spend that time. They can, they can recommend, they can romance, recommend it in direction of move. I mean, they will have studied it. But there's a difference between them recommending a model policy and rec and then recommending uh, directions for us to move around this issue. Well, I, okay. If, it, if that's what's going to get us there, I I don't agree with it, but I'm so, sorry. I, I guess I'm not appreciating the distinction. I, I would appreciate the uh, oversight committee coming back to us, having studied it, yes, with a recommendation, with a recommendation for well, what we, right. the direction we move it. Yes, they can still say this was yeah, a decision so. that we made that you could make differently. But to have, I, I think it changes the nature of feeling like there is something concrete to react to rather than a study after study. Of, right. Well, well they would come back. As a joint, the joint justice oversight committee always come back, comes back with recommendations. Right. That's how justice reinvestment one, justice reinvestment two, yes. all of those. That's how all of those happen. They come back with recommendations. I don't think I want them to come back with a recommendation for this is the model policy. Right. But they could come back I, with a direction, a recommended direction for us to. Um, and they they move. come back with like seven directions yeah. and stuff. But I don't I don't think I want them to options. develop a model policy. Right. I, I think we hear you on that. Okay. And I, I, but I think either recommendations for uh, options for the legislature to pursue or options well, for the direction for a direction. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's what they do. Recommended yeah. legislation? Yeah. Okay. And if we want to include, we could even go a step further or to say and model policies for law enforcement to adopt. Well, or no, I'm, I, I don't, I, I don't I want to think think she is wanting the legislature to do the model. The no, policies. I'm wanting no, them to come back and then see if we need to have a model policy or not. Right. right. And we, okay. But, I mean, I think we heard in the evidence that we do need a model policy. We heard that there are trainings happening with local law enforcement that we may think are concerning about how interrogations happen. I mean, you know, young people are two or three times more likely to confess based on false information. And there, this technique is being taught in the state. So I feel like the evidence was there that this isn't just a maybe we should look at it, but that there should be a model policy that's developed. Okay, I just don't, I don't think that they, well, okay, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I really, if they come back with a model policy, that's just fine. I don't actually like model policies, but that's a different thing. And, yeah. um, and I, and, and what we heard is that around training, they're already, the council, the criminal justice council is already doing that. So we're not looking at training here. We're looking at what are interviewing techniques and how do we get, when is it appropriate to, to use false information? When is it and not appropriate? It how do we deal with youth? The age. In the, yeah. So I think those are the things that they need to study. And so what is the model policy we'd be asking them to do? 
is it around youth? Is it around when to introduce false information? What is the model policy we're asking them to come up with? Is it one policy around this? Is it three policies because they it affects different areas? But maybe then it's just simply, I mean, I think it's up to the legislature to, to draft the policy, but maybe it's recommendations on directions for the legislature to pursue regarding these issues. We have asked, we asked, Isn't that what we're asking? We're asking, in my opinion, we're doing the same thing we did in 124. We were asking them to look into, into different ways of approaching the use of military equipment by police right. departments. And then they came in and they talked about it. And then we said, "Could do you think you could develop a model policy for people to use? And they said, yes. So they developed a model policy. And then we looked at that policy. I, I, I don't, I think that asking them to develop a model policy about something that we're, that you think has it's like. You think it's premature? Is that? Yes. Your, yeah, okay. Yes. That's what I, okay, that's what I hear you saying. That's what I'm saying. So you you're, want them to send them off to, to do, do some of the research with the time we don't have uh, and come back with recommendations for, for us to pursue. Yeah, well, they come back with, rec that is what the oversight, however you write up the stuff that the oversight committee looks at. And we, you just did it for um, qualified immunity. Except it's not the oversight committee, but right, right. come back with recommendations. Um, so I know that we have probably what five minutes to, to do this. Mm -hmm. Can no, I be excused for five minutes? <laughs> try to just take a chance to knock this out and then come back. You can do anything you want. We're here. Okay. And you can just, if it's easier to just go next door. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Yes. Thank you, Ben. And sorry for being. No. Well, we are agreed that we are going to put in there that all felony custodial interviews have to be recorded. We'll be recorded. That's the other, and then everything else is going into the study that we, yes. that we had just discussed. But, but that, yeah. Is that? Yeah, I think that I think that's where we're landing. I just I can't I just can't see us. I mean, Julio suggested that there were changes could be made in the bill as it is, and I just we don't have the time to do that. I get it. we're at zero hour. I get that. I would also suggest too that if for whatever reason the language that's come up is imperfect, um, to put it nicely, uh, you know there is the house process right. yeah, and we're clear. yeah so yeah. <laughs> we're, 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 we, we often depend right 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 the problem is do we trust them we some of us trust them <laughs> so we're in this in what you're doing now you're going to have the the section for the, the data collection report mm -hmm. and the section nine <clears throat> what we've just been talking about yeah, the data collection report is in this would be under Title 20. That's staying in a statute. Yeah. Um, and then this report concerning non-coercive tactics, the use of um, false information in the context of uh, juveniles and adults. Yes. Um, and uh, I'll, I will tweak the for okay. the rest to make it sound nicer. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ben.